come out this evening, and I'm happy to hear about the good experiences many of you are having. And one of our great concerns is you might continue to have that experience, that it will not be an emotional high of some kind that's forgotten about in a few days. And tonight's topic is dedicated to making sure that you have a continuing experience and not just a present one that's soon forgotten about. One way to have this experience continue is to have a burden for someone else. Over and over we're told that God gives us light and blessings we might share them with others. We live in a community that's made up largely of Seventh-day Adventists. And sometimes we assume that they do not need our help. But this community is filled with people crying for help. And I hope you realize that you can help them very, very much by kind words, interest, intercessory prayer, just praying with them sometimes, all sorts of things, however God leads you. And please, please do not assume that because they're faculty members or preachers that they don't need it too. That's not true. The whole church needs reviving. And I, by the church, I mean internationally speaking. We do. And I hope you're interested in this sufficiently to think about other people. If you get wrapped up in yourself, you'll soon degenerate into your experience as just very selfish and very morbid and dismal. And you'll soon lose it. But if you'll share, it'll remain with you. If you're grateful enough to tell others about it and praise the Lord for it and thank him for it, it'll prosper. And every day in your prayer life, seek to study, but seek to learn how to bless others. And you'll have a rich experience. The reason I'm speaking about the lure of, a, of an experience is that we live in a day when there's a great demand for unusual experiences. And a religious experience can relate to that very definitely. Some people want to usually experience something that's exciting, like skydiving. They're bored. They're tired of doing things over and over again. They want something different. And so in spite of the dangers, they go out to do some things like this. Others just look for something that's different, something to break up the monotony. Uh, sometimes they're seeking to satisfy some problem or some need in their lives. And so there are many experiences that people seek today, and I like to list some of them. Trips on drugs are really seeking an experience for many people. Some think it's not that, but it really is that often. A trip on drugs. Or they get trips also in rock music. Uh, freaked out, some people call it nowadays, I guess. Some people take a trip on and speak in tongues in the charismatic movement. They really do. They're seeking for some unusual experience. Not necessarily an experience with God, just something that's different. Something that's new and exciting. And they try those things. Some try to find these things in occult and mystic religions. In the study of them, or the meditation of them, or arriving at some intellectualism or some peculiar knowledge that makes them someone special and they have an, a unique experience. In all kinds of ways people are seeking experiences nowadays. Communal living can be seeking an experience. Or even rural living. Might not just get away from the small, they might be seeking a new experience. Uh, using the old style of living at the pioneers can be seeking a new experience is rather unusual. Uh, some of the travel that people indulge in nowadays, I mean the hitchhikers and others. Uh, all sorts of things, they're seeking a new experience, something unusual. Then they sit down to tell someone about the uniqueness or the specialty of that experience. And that makes them feel good. There's somebody, when they've had a very unusual experience, that they can share with everyone else. Now, into this type of thinking, in which many are indulging, not just a subculture by any means, many are indulging in this, in this type of thinking, you can in involve the religious experience. And some people can seek that just purely for an experience. They really can. An experience to talk about. And we ought to talk about it. A genuine experience. But some people just seek it for an experience sake. And that's very possible. And many are trying to do that nowadays. You have to become very careful when you start seeking experiences. The Lord would have us to have an experience. Many of them. He desires that. He offers that. It's a promise. But in doing this, we must be very, very careful for there's someone that doesn't like you to have a right experience that likes to corrupt them. 
In Luke chapter 10, there's a story about an experience, verses 17 and 20. And several months ago, I referred to it in another series of sermons. But this time, I want to take a different aspect of it. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. This is talking about the 70 disciples now when it speaks of the 70. It says, They returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Wouldn't you like to have that experience? They were casting out devils, healing the sick. Even the devils run when we say run. From human beings. We have control over demons. Isn't that a glorious experience? It says they returned with joy telling Christ about this. He remarks on it in two verses. Then in verse 20 he says, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not. In this rejoice not that the devil is subject unto you, you see. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Don't rejoice because the devil is subject unto you, but rather your names are written in heaven. Now, we like to rejoice in experiences, and he says, don't rejoice in that. That's a thrilling experience, isn't it? These marvelous miracles they're accomplishing in the name of the Lord. Uh, don't rejoice in that, he said, but rather your name is written down in heaven. Now, the fact your name was written in heaven was an act of faith. They hadn't seen it. They had to take the words of Jesus uh, as truth and accept them that way and believe it. He said, rejoice in that act of faith, not just in that experience you're having. In Desire of Ages, page 493, the servant Lord comments on this statement in verse 20. Jesus added, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Rejoice not in the possession of power. Rejoice not in the possession of power. Why not? Lest you lose sight of your dependence upon God. Rejoice not in the, in the possession of power, lest you lose sight of your dependence upon God. Be careful, lest self come in, and you work in your own strength, rather than in the spirit of strength of your master. Self is ever ready to take the credit if any measure of success attends the work. We like to pat ourselves on the back. It's quite natural, you see. Self is flattered and exalted, and the impression is not made upon other minds that God is all and in all. She finishes up that paragraph in these words. Then rejoice that through Christ you have become connected with God, members of the heavenly family. While you look higher than yourself, you have a continual sense of the weakness of humanity. While you look higher than yourself, you have a continual sense of the weakness of humanity. The less you cherish self, the more distinct and full be your comprehension of the excellence of your Savior. The more closely you connect yourself with the source of light and power, the greater light will be shed upon you, and the greater power will be yours to work for God. Rejoice that you are one with God, one with Christ, and with the whole family of heaven. You see in these experiences, it's Desire of Ages 493, and these experiences, uh, which are good, there are difficulties. And we need the experiences. And no way should we shun them at all. But in seeking an experience, we must be very careful that our motives are right. We must be very careful that the results of the experience are correct. The Lord said, even that miraculous experience you're having, be most careful. Rejoice, rather, your names are written down in heaven. You belong to the family of God, and you have evidence of that not in this experience of even casting out devils. Rejoice not in that. We can trust so much to an experience that sometimes we do not act by faith in more important things, knowing that we're children of God, a fact promised in the scripture, something on which you can hang your hat that's valid. And sometimes the devil can corrupt an experience, and some of you have spoken to me about that. We must never use an experience in a place of our faith in God's Word. Amen. Never. God's Word is always the most valid. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. We must have an experience. We must have one that revives our souls. We must make sure that's genuine, that's biblical, that it prospers and continues. In Selective Messages, Book 1, and page 129, there's a whole chapter on safeguarding our experience. And I recommend that you get the book and read it very carefully and prayerfully. 
It refers to page 129, Second Message, Book 1, and it goes on to page 131. Read the whole chapter if you have time. Back in the 1880 movement, they had a, a wonderful experience in Battle Creek, a very wonderful movement and experience. Many had it. It took place in 1893, according to the introduction to this chapter. <clears throat> she says, after the outpouring of the Spirit of God in Battle Creek, it was proved in the college that a time of great spiritual light is also a time of corresponding spiritual darkness. <clears throat> it was proved in Battle Creek that a time of great spiritual light is also a time of corresponding spiritual darkness. It happened to Seventh-day Adventists right there in a time of a great revival. <clears throat> Satan and his legions of satanic agencies are on the ground, pressing their powers upon every soul to make of none effect the showers of grace that have come from heaven to revive and quicken the dormant energies into decided action to impart that which God has imparted. Had all the many souls then enlightened gone to work at once to impart to others that which God had given to them for that very purpose, more light would have been given, more power bestowed. <clears throat> God does not give light merely for one person, but that he may diffuse light and God be glorified. Its influence is felt, it said, he's be glorified in it. <clears throat> now, wherever there's spiritual light and spiritual revival, Satan is there. He doesn't like it. <clears throat> and some of you can testify to that fact. He doesn't want you to have a genuine experience. He doesn't want you to rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't want you to rest in the arms of Christ. He doesn't want you to know whom you believed. He doesn't want certainty of faith. He doesn't like that. <clears throat> and he doesn't sleep. We get too busy to pray. We get too sleepy to pray or to study. He doesn't. He doesn't. And if we really appreciate what God gives to us, we will do anything to keep it and to maintain it. <clears throat> and the devil doesn't want you to have it, so he'll get you awfully busy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or he'll keep you up very late at night, so the next morning you just cannot possibly pray and study and still make it to work. And he does that with many of us, doesn't he? Over and over again. And two or three nights like that and a whole week is ruined of spirituality. And your experience has just gone down the drain. <clears throat> and it's very difficult to recover it. She continues there and says, In every age, seasons of spiritual revival and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit have been followed by spiritual darkness and prevailing corruptions. In every age. <clears throat> it doesn't matter when this takes place, the devil always goes to work with a vengeance. Look in the Protestant Reformation. In any country in Europe, <clears throat> there was always darkness after revival. The devil is right there in the job carrying on the great controversy. It says the light that would shine in clear and distinct rays will grow dim amid the moral darkness. The aggressive power of the truth of God is dependent upon the cooperation of the human agent with God in piety, in zeal, and unselfish efforts to get the light of truth before others. We must get busy, you see. We must be zealous because he's blessed us so much. We must keep on seeking and praying, or it'll soon be gone. <clears throat> there have been things written to me in regard to the movings of the Spirit of God at the last conference, 1893, and at the college, which clearly indicate that because these blessings were not lived up to, minds have been confused, and that which was light from heaven has been called excitement. <clears throat> they wrote to her about this. And because the revival fizzled out, and dwindled down to nothing. They wrote to her and said it must have been a false revival. God must not have been in it. She said this is not true. They call it excitement. She continues on, I have been made sad to have this matter viewed in this light. We must be very careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Apparently he was there, you see. Be careful not to grieve him. In pronouncing the ministration of his Holy Spirit a species of fanaticism, don't you call it that, she said. How shall we understand the workings of the Spirit of God if it was not revealed in clear and unmistakable lines, not only in Battle Creek but in many places? She said, this was definitely the Holy Spirit. Why do you call it excitement and fanaticism? She said, I'm not surprised that anyone should be confused 
at the after result, see, because it did deteriorate. But in my experience of the past 49 years, I have seen much of these things, and I have known that God has wrought in a marked manner, and let no one venture to say this is not the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Don't you dare say that, she said. No one. In the past few years, in <clears throat> many Adventist institutions and churches, we've seen a temporary revival. And because it dwindled out and was looked upon as emotionalism and all sorts of things, and sometimes there was more of that than some good sense occasionally, <clears throat> people branded not of the Holy Spirit. A false excitement. Do you know enough about the Holy Spirit to say that? Are you such an expert on the work of the Holy Spirit that you can honestly say that? <clears throat> Do you have such a valid experience of the Holy Spirit yourself that you can criticize some other experience? Do you? It's about time you started preaching up here then. <clears throat> and in this city, on the street corners, all over this place. If you have that kind of experience to criticize any kind of revival, any place, it's time you stood up and were heard. Do you know that? Tell us what you know, if you know so much. Tell us what you know if you're an expert on the Holy Spirit. It's time. If you have that information without sharing it, you're robbing us. And if you don't have it, what right do you have to say anything? Do you understand what I'm saying? If you do not have that knowledge of the Spirit of God and His Word, what right do you have to say anything? I've listened to far too many people who need a revival criticizing revivals, as though they were expert on it and didn't have it themselves, no form of it, and yet they would criticize any type of revival. I do not feel qualified to criticize revivals. <clears throat> I hope you don't either. And the, God, the Lord of Heaven surely wants to work in Adventist schools, does he not? And he's more willing to give the Spirit than parents are to give good gifts to their children. Then are you sure he didn't try to do something in that institution and it was the weakness of humanity and the power of the devil that caused it to fail? Are you sure? How much do we know about revivals, Seventh-day Adventists? Genuine revival. How well informed are we about these? How many experiences have you had with revivals? She said, I've seen them again and again. And she said, they've always come along with a spiritual... A, a time of darkness following them. Always. In all my experience and all through history. Just because it dwindles out doesn't mean the Spirit of God wasn't there. And this is not making it impossible for a, to have a false revival by any means. We must be very careful how we criticize the work of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> she said, It is just that we which are authorized to believe and pray for for God is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him than parents are to give good gifts unto their children. But the Holy Spirit is not for the human agent to work. It is to work and use the human agent. That God did abundantly bless the students in the school and the church. I have not one doubt. But a period of great light and the outpouring of the Spirit is quite generally followed by a time of great darkness. Why? Because the enemy works with all his deceiving energies to make of none effect the deep movings of the Spirit of God on the human subject. That's why. And you cannot check the genuineness of a revival by the results. You cannot. Unless you discern the presence of the enemy who causes poor results sometimes. She goes on to describe what happened to that revival in Battle Creek and some of you read it already because you quoted it to me. The next paragraph says, When the students at the school went into their match games and football playing, when they became absorbed in the amusement question, Satan saw it a good time to step in and make of none effect the Holy Spirit of God in the molding and using the human subject. It took place the following Sunday. If you read the records of it, he saw it was a good time to step in and make of no effect the work of the Spirit of God. And she lists three ways the devil can ruin a revival in the next paragraph. It is an easy matter to idle away, talk, and play away the Holy Spirit's influence. She said they played away the one at Battle Creek. There's another one she mentioned that they talked away. They left the church, 
They lingered and talked and talked and talked about everything else except the Spirit of God and His work upon their hearts. It's good to remain and talk if you stay with the subject and the theme. It's easy to talk it away if you talk about the weather and your job and your friends and your neighbors and, you know, all the other things. Your play and games and everything that you can think about. Cars and dresses and cooking and houses, you know. We can think of many things to socialize. We're experts at that. But that's not the work of the Spirit of God. Just the chit-chat can completely deprive your mind of the Spirit of God and His working. The devil will give you something to talk about. He says, it is an easy matter to idle away, talk and play away the Holy Spirit's influence. To walk in the light is to keep moving onward in the direction of light. If the one blessed becomes negligent and inattentive, does not watch unto prayer, if he does not lift the cross and bear the yoke of Christ, if his love of, of amusements and strivings for the mastery absorb his power ability, then God has not made the first and best and last in everything. And Satan comes in to act his part in playing the game of life for his soul. He can play much more earnestly than they can play and make deep laid plots for the ruin of the soul. <clears throat> This is a real serious game. Absorption in any other subject will lure us away into neglect, lethargy, forgetfulness, all sorts of things. The theme of the mind, the moving of the spirit, is supplanted by another subject. The interest is eradicated. The devil is an expert at this and knows how to do it very, very well. She mentions in many places, by the way, how these revivals have been ruined entirely by the spirit of Satan. If you don't think he's in a place like this, I beg of you to open your eyes and I pray for the Lord to open your eyes and your ears. There are just hundreds of things that happen every day to deprive you of the blessing you're seeking or the blessing you've found. Hundreds of things. He does not want us to have these things. And it requires a struggle. It requires persistence in prayer. It requires constant study. It requires a constant seeking. It requires effort for others. Or snatched away so quickly. And then we say, oh well, you know, perhaps it wasn't real. No, the question is, perhaps I wasn't real. Perhaps I was asleep on the job, or I would continue to be blessed by him. Now, some people have trouble with experiences because they're, they desire something new and strange. Be careful of seeking an experience just for something new or something different. In the uh, book of Evangelism, page 611, <clears throat> there's a whole chapter on this in the Message, book 2 as well. There's a class of people who are always ready to go off on some tangent, who want to catch up something strange and wonderful and new. Do you ever notice how Adventists like to talk about those things? We like to talk about the strange and wonderful and new things. The editor of the review is writing about one of those strange and wonderful new things in the recent review, just inside the cover page. And many of you have been caught up in this. Many of you. Strange and wonderful and new. This man writes about. She said, there's a class who are always ready to go off on some tangent, catch up something that's strange, wonderful, and new. But God desires us all to move calmly, considerably, choosing our words in harmony with the solid truth for this time. To move calmly, considerably, choosing our words in harmony with the solid truth for this time. No doubts, you see. The truth should be represented to the mind as free as possible from that which is emotional, while still bearing the intensity and solemnity befitting its character. See, as free as possible from emotionalism, but bearing the intensity and solemnity befitting the message. We must guard against encouraging extremists, those who be either in the fire or in the water, either burning up or cold, freezing down in the water, you see? Burning or putting it out. We must guard against inspiring that sort of thing. Now, Ellen White advises us to have an experimental religion. I would like to read it for you in Five Testimonies, page 221. 
And I recommend you read these two testaments, volume 3, pages 68 and 9, and volume 5, page 221. This will help you a great deal about experimental religion. How shall we know for ourselves God's goodness and his love? How shall you know for yourself? That's an experience, isn't it? How can you know for yourself? The psalmist tells us not hear and know, read and know, or believe and know. He tells us not hear and know, read and know, or believe and know, K-N-O-W. But taste and see that the Lord is good. The psalmist tells us not hear or listen and know, not read and, and see, and not read and know, or believe and know, but taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste. Not just hear, not just he, uh, read, and not just believe. Taste and see the Lord is good. Instead of relying upon the word of another, taste for yourself. We don't always have to be telling mission stories about Africa and South America and Australia and so on. We need to start telling some mission stories about Loma Linda. Do you know that? That are worth telling in this pulpit. That are worth listening to. We need to start telling those, not to depreciate foreign missions, not at all. We need to have those experiences here, you and I. So we can send our experiences over there. You know? Not just our dollars, but our experiences too. Our dollar is losing its value, and perhaps we're going to have to send something better than dollars. No. They've been sending us something back better than dollars in many cases, you know. Perhaps the exchange ought to reverse itself now. And so we must uh, taste and know for ourselves. Then she says experience is knowledge derived from experiment. Experience is knowledge derived from experiment. Experimental knowledge, religion rather, is what is needed now. Experimental religion is what is needed now. Some, yes, a large number, have a theoretical knowledge of religious truth, but have never felt the renewing power of divine grace upon their hearts. Some, she said, yes, a large number have a theoretical knowledge of religious truth, truth but have never felt renewing power of divine grace upon their hearts. So her counsel is to have an experimental religion. You taste until you can testify that it really is good. You know it yourself. You don't have to quote the preacher or somebody else who told you about it. You don't have to quote someone else's experience. You can say, I know. I've tried it myself. It works. I like it. It pleases me greatly. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience derived by experiment. Now she talks about experience derived by experiment on page uh, 68 and 9 of volume 3 of the Testimonies. She says, but that which many term experience is not experience at all. This is the caution now. That which many term experience is not experience at all. It is simply habit or mere indulgence, blindly and frequently ignorantly followed with a firm set determination without intelligent thought or inquiry relative to the laws at work and the accomplishing of the results. What we call experience, he said, is not experience at all. It's simply habit sometimes, mere indulgence, blindly, frequently, and ignorantly followed with a firm set determination and without intelligent thought or inquiry relative to the laws at work and the accomplishment of the result. If you did that in this university in research labs, they'd throw you out in five seconds. But we use the most unscientific methods to verify our experiences and to work out our experiments. Very unscientific methods we've used. And yet we're sure our experience is valid on that poor basis. She continues the next paragraph. Real experience is a variety of careful experiments. Real experience is a variety of careful experiments made with a mind freed from prejudice. Now we have so many prejudices. Made with a mind freed from prejudice and uncontrolled by previously established opinions and habits. Uncontrolled by previously established opinions and habits. The results are marked with careful solicitude and an anxious desire to learn, to improve, and to reform on every habit that is not in harmony with physical and moral laws. I must take the very same cautions that a person in a laboratory does. Put out all preconceived opinions, all prejudices, all things in my mind about it, and let the experiment prove what is right or wrong. I must not jump to conclusions. And I must not base conclusions on 
poorly conducted experiments. We come to a place when many people look upon themselves as an authority on Christian experience because of their experience, their past experience. There are even some who teach and believe that their experience is on a par with the Bible as an authority or the spirit prophecy. They say, I have an experience and I know it's true. Therefore, the Bible has to conform to my experience or the spirit of prophecy to my experience. Or we do another thing. We interpret the Bible and the spirit of prophecy according to our experience. Friends, that is not an unprejudiced mind. That's not objective thinking. Not at all. And too many times we've done this. And so we say, I know and I'm sure this is right because I experienced this. How did you experience it? How careful were you? How cautious? What restrictions did you follow? What are the limitations you see? How many prejudices did you have in your mind? What did you do? Now, too many of us today are basing with great certainty and conviction our future on past experience. And too often that experience has been conducted in a haphazard, slipshod way. We come to conclusions based on on not a genuine experience at all, but just by a a foolish experience. Volume 3, page 68 and 9 of the Testimonies. Volume 5 and page uh, 221. I beg of you to read these because many are having experiences now, and uh, I'm not questioning your experience in the least. I don't want the devil to deprive you of them, and I want to make sure we build on a solid ground, very solid ground that we do not just establish an experience for the sake of having one. In my morning devotions, I've been reading thoughts amount of blessings, just as slowly as I can go. Uh, we go so fast, we forget the wonderful thoughts we had yesterday, tomorrow. Isn't that right? Can't remember one of them. And somehow we've got to slow down enough to let all those things seep in and stay there. And as I was reading through this, I was impressed that this is the experience that many are having, that many of us need. Forgive me for reading all this, but it's uh, said in such a nice way, much better than I can. It says it so perfectly. It's commenting on the text in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? Why do you look at somebody else the way you do in criticism? Page 125 to 129, you can find these random comments I'll make and read from here. His words describe one who is swift to discern a defect in others. I can quickly see what's wrong with you. When he thinks he has detected a flaw in the character or the life, he is exceedingly zealous in trying to point it out. But Jesus declares that the very trait of character, that very trait of character, developed in doing this unchristlike work, is in comparison with the fault criticized as a beam in proportion to a moat. The beam is large, you see, the mode is very small. The one who criticizes has the weighty guilt. The mode is a very small thing. It is one's own lack of the spirit of forbearance and love that leads him to make a world of an atom. When I do this to you, it is one's own lack of the spirit of forbearance and love that leads him to make a world of an atom. Those who have never experienced the contrition of an entire surrender to Christ do not in their life make manifest the softening influence of the Savior's love. This is the experience I think described very nicely that many are having. It is one's own lack of the spirit of, I'm sorry, those who have never experienced the contrition of an entire surrender to Christ. That means what kind of a sinner am I that required the death of Jesus for me? Not just the whole world, but for me said, those who have never experienced the contrition of an entire surrender to Christ do not in their life make manifest the softening influence of the Savior's love. We do something else. They misrepresent the gentle, courteous spirit of the gospel and wound precious souls for whom Christ died. According to the figure that our Savior uses, he who indulges a censorious spirit is guilty of greater sin than is the one he accuses. For he not only commits the same sin, but adds to it conceit and conscience and censoriousness. Criticizes, proud, so on. The thing I want to bring out there, those who never experienced the contrition of an entire surrender to Christ, 
do not in their life make manifest the softening influence of the Savior's love. She continues on page 127. It is useless for you to build yourselves up in self-righteousness. What you need is a change of heart. You must have this experience before you are fitted to correct others. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, Matthew 12, 34. I will correct you wrongly if my own heart has not been softened and broken and made new. At the top of the next page, page 128, you must be good before you can do good. There are preliminary statements to that I don't want to read this time. You must be good before you can do good. You cannot exert an influence that will transform others until your own heart has been humbled and refined and made tender by the grace of Christ. When this change has been wrought in you, it will be as natural for you to live to bless others as it is for the rose bush to yield its fragrant bloom or the vinous purple clusters. Mount of Blessings, page 128. When this change has been wrought in you, it will be as natural for you to live to bless others as it is for the rose bush to yield its fragrant bloom or the vinous purple clusters. When my heart is transformed and broken and softened, when I have a contrite spirit, when the Lord has made me good by giving me a new heart, because none of us are good, it will be just as natural for me to live to bless you as the rose blossom its fragrant blossoms and the vine its nice grapes. Just as automatic. Nice, sweet things come out because a nice, sweet heart has been given to me. Right? This is a necessity. If Christ is in you, the hope of glory, you will have no disposition to watch others. No disposition. None. If he's in you, the hope of glory, you have no disposition to watch others, to expose their errors. Instead of seeking to accuse and condemn, it will be your object to help, to bless and to save. My, how we need that. In dealing with those who are in error, you will heed the injunction, Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6.1 you will call to mind the many times you have erred, and how hard it is to find the right way when you had once left it. You will not push your brother into greater darkness, for the heart full of pity will tell him of his danger. It tells you how to do it. With a heart full of pity, you'll tell him of his danger. He who looks often upon the cross of Calvary, remembering that his sins placed the Savior there, will never try to estimate the degree of his guilt in comparison with that of others. He'll never try... To estimate the degree of his guilt in comparison with others when he looks often at Calvary. How many have comparative religion? Better than, holier than, more righteous than, you know. On and on you can go. This is something we like as Adventists. Because they, we think it's going to make us get to heaven, you see. And it gives us a right to be there if we're better than somebody else. That's the wrong way. We'll never get there that way. Never said, you will call to mind the many times you've heard and how hard it is for you to find the right way when once left it. And you'll never find their fault, you see. She goes on and says, there can be no spirit of criticism or self-exaltation on the part of those who walk in the shadow of Calvary's cross. Not until you feel that you could sacrifice your own self-dignity. Now listen to her words. Not until you feel you could sacrifice your own self-dignity. Even lay down your life in order to save an erring brother. Have you cast the beam out of your own eye so that you're prepared to help your brother? Amen. Do you know what you said? Do you know what you said? Not until you're willing to sacrifice your own self-dignity, lose your entire reputation, no dignity left, sacrifice the whole thing, and even lay down your life in order to save an erring brother, have you really cast the beam out of your own eye so that you prepare to help your brother? Not until then is the beam gone. The beam is always there until I'm willing to die for my erring brother who might have transgressed against me. Till I'll forsake and sacrifice all my self-dignity to save that one soul. She says, then you can approach him and touch his heart. No one has ever been reclaimed from a wrong position by censure and reproach. But many have thus been driven from Christ and led to seal their hearts against conviction. A tender spirit, a gentle winning deportment may save the erring and hide a multitude of sins. 
The revelation of Christ in your own character will have a transforming power upon all with whom you come in contact. Let Christ be daily made manifest in you, and he will reveal through you the creative energy of his word, a gentle, persuasive, persuasive yet mighty influence to recreate others, other souls in the beauty of the Lord our God. He'll just come right out of you. Let him be made daily manifest in you. He'll reveal through you the creative energy of his word, a gentle, persuasive, yet mighty influence to recreate other souls in the beauty and the, of the Lord our God. I'm grateful for those who have found and those who are seeking this experience. Most grateful. It sticks out. Do you know that? It's so obvious by contrast. I know how easy it is to find fault. I know how automatic it can be. And I know how we can even justify finding fault and excuse it and think it's the right thing to do. And I know how we think that perhaps we're helping people by telling them what's wrong. But she says, no one has ever claimed that way. It's amazing when we're humbled by coming into the presence of Christ, kneeling at the foot of the cross, how suddenly everyone looks so good. It's amazing. When I see what I've done to Jesus at Calvary, I can find no one worse than I am. No one. And those who walk often in the light of Calvary can just not find much trouble or fault with anybody else. You know, it's very nice to be with people like that. Very nice. And somehow, you know, I can never find out my heart to try to get ahead of you by any method or means if I recognize what I've done to Jesus at Calvary. I cannot find it in my heart to even try to get ahead of you. And I can't find it in my heart to boast about very much either because I can't find much to boast about. Need I go on? You know, friends, these are the things we need all over this place. This is what we need. It's easy to find fault with our children when they've done so many wrong things. And how quickly we do because they bring disgrace upon us. She says, Now until you're willing to sacrifice yourself, dignity is the beam gone from your eye. And these children can sure get rid of our dignity in a hurry, can't they? And how much it embarrasses us and how terrible we feel. She said, Not until you're willing to die for the earring, the wayward one. Are you ready then to bless them? Not until then. Friends, the devil buys us awfully cheap, doesn't he? Our love for souls and our love for Jesus. He gets us at a cheap price. And yet we profess to love him and love each other. I know how hard it is to kneel down before the Lord and discover what kind of a sinner I am. And I know what it does to me. And I know how easy it is to forget that. And the devil wants you to forget and wants me to forget too. And as soon as I forget, suddenly you're not very good. None of you. And as long as I remember, I'm not very good and you're all very good. It's so easy to forget, isn't it? And how often we need to linger there at the cross. And the experience that many of you have had that's brought you there has given you that humility and contrition so that all the retaliation, all the vengeance, all the, can you top this, all the answers you're tempted to give are just forgotten about. And that soft answer to turn it away wrath is the regular, routine way. I'm so grateful that many have had this experience. And friends, may we not be afraid to come humbly to the foot of the cross and let Jesus and the Spirit of God tell us what we really are like, not what we think we're like. And then be happy for that humility, for Christ humbled himself in a tremendous fashion. Happy for it. And you know something? Other people will be happy for it too. Because it's so nice to live with you, so very pleasant. The divorces will almost stop automatically. 
when this happens in a home, to just one person, it almost automatically stops. It's very difficult to fight with somebody that just never has any retaliation or anything evil to say about you or any criticism. It's very difficult. And some of you are testifying that your spouses are already changed. That's a marvelous thing. But may we also realize in all of this that the devil would try to take it away. And may we so understand each other and forget self that we'll just beseech heaven that the Lord will protect each one of us, that he'll maintain and sustain this marvelous experience many are having, that he'll grant it to many others. May we be so careful about others and so filled with concern about them that every day we'll be praying for them and asking, Lord, how can I be a blessing to them? What can I say that will not be criticism, but will be kindness and understanding and compassion so that the love of Jesus will be manifested? Friends, as we stick with this and pray about it and seek it earnestly and beseech heaven to intercede on the behalf of others, you'll be amazed what will happen to you and to me and to this whole community. I'm certain that God is counting on us. I'm certain that he's working way beyond anything we deserve, a thousand times over, that his grace is being manifested. May we appreciate it so much and realize that God wants to do something good for everybody and not harbor it for ourselves. This is what the Lord desires for every one of us. May he grant you a marvelous experimental knowledge of him and safeguard it every day is my prayer in Jesus' name. Shall we stand? Loving Father in heaven, there have been many good testimonies given here by word and also by changed lives. We're thankful that some have shared with others and witnessed to the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the marvels of redeeming love. We're thankful our hearts have been touched and changed and humbled and made contrite. We pray and beseech heaven tonight protect us from the evil one. May we pray for each other, intercede on behalf of the other. May we spend much time in our concern and interest in others. Lord, keep us about our Father's business, loving souls for thee in a very special way. We know this blessing has come to us that it might be a blessing to others. So teach us how to share, how to be kind and compassionate. Forbid that in any way we should look upon the flaws and faults of others and criticize. May we only seek to help and to bless. Lord, continue to bless us. We praise thee for the blessings we receive. We thank thee. We're so happy. Continue to abide with us, for we ask it in Jesus' name.